Welcome again. My name is David Thoreau. I'm the president of the C.S. Lewis Society of California. I want to welcome you uh, to our special event this evening. We're so delighted that you joined with us. Uh, for those new to the C.S. Lewis Society, we invite you to visit our website, which is lewissociety.org, and send us an email note to info at lewissociety.org and be happy to add you to our regular email list. Tonight, we're hosting a widely acclaimed one-man stage play entitled An Evening with C.S. Lewis, My Life's Journey with this British actor and playwright, David Payne. David has performed An Evening with C.S. Lewis well over a thousand times, thrilling over a million viewers and winning him such accolades from critics as extraordinary, a must-see, a master class, brilliant, and far more wonderful comments on his work. We incidentally had the pleasure of co-sponsoring the play in April 2019 in San Francisco at the Marines Memorial Theater. There were six performances. And incidentally, if you go to the C.S. Lewis Society YouTube channel, you'll find an interview uh, by me of David on stage um, at the end of the Saturday performance. We were preparing incidentally to co-sponsor uh, the stage play in San Jose at the California Theater this past March, but the COVID-19 pandemic hit and the performances by David were, were discontinued across the country and elsewhere. As a result, we're especially pleased to be hosting our event this evening. Our format for tonight is we're gonna first show the video of the play, which has been edited by David down for our time constraints but just long enough to tantalize you to want to see the entire show. Afterward, we'll have, of course, a conversation with David and questions from you in the audience. As background for the play itself, the setting is the year 1963, and the world-renowned author C.S. Lewis is hosting a group of American writers at his home near Oxford. They're about to experience a captivating evening with a man who's engaging conversation and spontaneous humor have made him one of the great raconteurs of his day. In the visit, Lewis recalls the events and people that inspired and shaped his life, including his childhood, his education, his career, his spiritual journey from a militant atheism to embrace Christianity, his books, his family and friends, including J.R.R. Tolkien and other members of the literary group they founded called the Inklings, and the American woman Joy Davidman, who he married and turned his life upside down. So let's begin the show. Well, good evening. My name is C.S. Lewis, but do feel free to call me Jack. Most of my friends do. And right at the outset, let me answer a question I'm very often asked by people who know that my real name is not Jack and wonder how I came to be so named. Well, that dates back to when I was four years old. And even at that tender young age, I'd already come to the conclusion that my given names, Clive Staples, <laughs> would be a serious impediment to my future happiness. <laughs> so one day I marched up to my parents, pointed to myself and said, he is Jaxie. And thereafter, I would answer to no other name. It was later shortened to Jack, and that's how I have been known ever since. Jacksy, because that was the name of my first dog. <laughs> Who, by the way, had another rather unfortunate first in his short canine career. He was the first dog ever to be run over by a motor car in Northern Ireland. And as there was only one such vehicle in the province at the time, and it ran very slow, this was no mean achievement. Well, welcome to my home. I hope you're not too squashed in. British houses are not as big as their American counterparts, I'm told. Now, I know what you're thinking. 
you're thinking exactly what the poet T.S. Eliot said to me when he first met me. Mr. Lewis, you appear much older than your published photographs would lead me to believe. <laughs> One felt like replying, Mr. Eliot, you appear more lucid than your published poems would lead me to believe. <laughs> But I refrained, though that first meeting between us was a little tense, we eventually went on to become quite good friends. Though to this day we've maintained a mutual dislike for each other's literary offerings. <laughs> and speaking of literary offerings, your leader tells me you are mostly writers and all from America. Well, I have to say, without my American readers, I think my success as an author would be somewhat diminished. What do they say? An author is not without honor, save in his own country. Or is that a prophet? <laughs> now, your leader also tells me you want me to give you a sort of potted history of my life. Well, be it on your own heads. I never think a man is at his best when he is on public show, mainly because his ego invariably is. And when that little monster is rampant, facts are rarely safe. <laughs> E-G-O, embellish, garnish, overstate. Warney and I were allies from the start and we had such fun in our childhood home in Belfast. It was called Little Lee. However, it was anything but little. It was so large, it seemed to me more like a city than a house. And I am a product of long corridors, upstairs indoor silences, attics to be explored in solitude. And because my parents were bookish people, endless books. And I turned the pages of many of them. You see, my parents had taught me that to open a new book was to open oneself to a new adventure. And so I had many wonderful adventures without so much as putting one foot outside the front door of our house. And one of the greatest adventures I ever had was when I was one day thumbing through a book of poetry by Longfellow and I stumbled across these words. I heard a voice that cried, Boulder the beautiful is dead, dead. Now I had never even heard of Boulder. But these words brought on an extraordinary mystical sensation. I had this notion of great expanses of northern sky, and I was soon overwhelmed with an exquisite sense of joy. Of course, the more I tried to hold on to this sensation, the more it slipped away. Nevertheless, it was those few words about Border that first ignited my passion for Norse mythology. Yes, I loved that house. But like all love affairs, it had its sorrows. My greatest sorrow came when I stood at the foot of my mother's bed, just after she had lost her fight with cancer. And at the time, I remember thinking, it's the end of my world. I shall never be happy again. Things will never be the same again. Not long after mother died, I was forced to leave Little Lee, not because father was selling it, but because I was being sent to boarding school in England. Can you imagine the desolation of a nine-year-old boy who has lost much of what he holds dear and then finds himself traveling to a foreign and foreboding land? Our destination when we reached the mainland was a small town about 20 miles north of London, of which one of the principal establishments was Wynyard Boarding School for Boys, the boarding school to which we were being sent. 
its proprietor, was also its headmaster, and the boys called him Oldie. <laughs> well, one day Oldie beat a boy so mercilessly that the authorities stepped in and closed the school down. Joy, oh joy, I was sent back to Belfast. Warney was less fortunate and shipped off to another boarding school in England. And Oldie was certified insane and committed to a mental institution. Now, my joy was short-lived. For a few months later, I was once again boarding the ferry to England, this time for another boarding school in the town of Malvern, which is in the heart of the English countryside. And it was at Malvern that my education really began, and it was also at Malvern that I made my first independent philosophical stand. My perception of God was that he was rather like someone who never answers your letters. So you eventually come to the conclusion that either they do not exist or you've got the address wrong. <laughs> and in my case, I concluded that God did not exist and slid very happily into a youthful brand of atheism. One day I invited Tollers and a man called Hugo Dyson to dine with me at Magdalen. Now at this juncture I ought to point out that Tollers is a very sincere Christian, as indeed is Hugo. And after we had dined, as it was a balmy autumnal evening, we took a turn, as Jane Austen would say, through the Magdalen grounds. And our conversation ranged over many subjects, but finally settled on religion. And it was then that I happened to remark that I thought the story of Christ was nothing more than a myth. Well, that set Tolos off. Jackie said, in a way, I have some sympathy with your remark. As you know, I believe all mythology contains some element of eternal truth. But the story of Christ is fundamentally different. You see, the author of that myth was God himself. The myth actually took place at a precise point in human history. And the whole of the myth is absolute truth. I said, even the dying and rising bit? He said, of course. I said, well, tell us. That is very hard to swallow. Jack, he said, you amaze me. If you meet the idea of a dying and rising God in pagan literature, you don't mind it at all. You only object to it when you meet it in the Gospels. And he was right. Well, by the time they left me, it was 4 a.m. in the morning. And my mind was was in a whirl. But when I put my head on the pillow that night, I was beginning to see two things very clearly indeed. You see, I realized that I had come to accept that God was God primarily by a series of logical steps. I also realized that if I was going to accept that Christ was God, it would not be by an act of logic, but by an act of faith. Now, the very next day, Warney and I had planned a trip to Whipsnade Zoo. We were going in Warney's motorbike and sidecar. And what happened that morning is not easy to put into words, so I shall put it this way. When I got into that sidecar, I did not believe that Christ was God. When I got out an hour and a half later at Whipsnade Zoo, I did. <laughs> One day I was taking a tutorial and there was a knock on the door. It was the college porter and he slipped a note in my hand and it read, Mrs. Gresham has been rushed into hospital and is asking for you. As soon as the tutorial was over, I called the hospital. They told me that she had just had an operation for a broken femur. She wouldn't be seeing anyone that night because she was too heavily sedated. 
but that I could go in the next night. And I did. And when I walked into her room, she said, have you seen the doctors? I said, no. She said, well, then you don't know, do you? And I said, no, what? She said, it's cancer, Jack. I said, cancer? I said, Joy, I called the hospital and they told me it was a broken femur. She said, Jack, it broke because it was riddled with cancer. The doctors tell me I have bone cancer, Jack. I said, well, what does that mean? She said, they also tell me I have weeks, no more than months to live. And then I went quiet. She said, are you all right, Jack? I said, oh, yes, I'm fine. She said, no, you're not. What's up? I said, all right, Joy, as you've asked, I will tell you. I just hate the thought of losing you. In such a short time, you've become one of my best friends. She said, thank you for saying that, Jack. That means a lot to me. But she said, when I'm gone, you'll have lots of friends. There's Tollers, there's Hugo, and of course there's Warney. And before I could stop myself, I said, yes, but I'm not in love with them, Joy. She said, what did you say? I said, I'm not in love with them. I'm in love with you. Then she started crying, and I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> They're going to throw me out for upsetting a patient. I said, Joy, please don't cry. I shouldn't have said that. That was irresponsible. I shouldn't have said it. I've upset you. She said, Jack, I'm not crying because I'm upset. I'm crying because I love you too. I said, are you sure? <laughs> she said, yes, have done for some time. <laughs> so there we were holding hands like a couple of lovebirds. <laughs> and then before I could stop myself, I said, Joy, will you marry me? <laughs> she said, we are married, Jack. <laughs> I said, yes, in the eyes of the British government, but not in the eyes of God, will you marry me? She said, Jack, you know what the doctors are saying. Do you really want to go through all that? I said, yes, I do. I said, do I have to get down on one knee? She said, well, you didn't do it the first time you proposed. <laughs> I said, well, I can get down on one knee, Joy, but someone might burst in. She said, well, if they do, count to five very slowly, say a loud amen and get up looking very pious. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jack, she said, if you're going to propose, stay very close. So I gripped her hand even harder and I said, all right, I'm not used to this. She said, well, I'm going to make it easy for you. The answer is yes. I said, that's it? Yes, she said, that's it. I said, I don't have to do anything else. She said, well, you have to kiss me, Jack. So I leaned forward and kissed her on the forehead. <laughs> no, Jack, she said, you have to kiss me properly. So I leaned forward and kissed her on the lips. And after I had kissed her, I realized what I had done. And I said, goodness gracious, I have not kissed a woman like that in over 30 years. She said, yes, I can tell. <laughs> Kiss me again, you need the practice. The last time she was rushed into hospital, she was in intense pain. But she never lost her courage and she never lost her sense of perspective. Don't get me a posh coffin, Jack, she said. Posh coffins are all rot. And I was with her when she died. Both Warney and I were plunged into despair. Warney did as he had often done in a crisis. He turned 
to drink. I did as I had often done in a crisis. I picked up my pen and wrote. And those early words that I wrote were very angry. I was angry with myself. I was angry with the doctors. And I was very angry with God. I remember one night screaming at him, you led us up the garden path. Time after time, when you seemed most gracious, you were really preparing the next torture. <laughs> you know, grief affects people in different ways, doesn't it? We're not all made the same. For me, it was like a mist had descended and engulfed me. A morning mist, if you like, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. And I felt so disorientated. And I remember thinking things I'd never thought before, saying things I'd never said before, like screaming what I screamed at God. And when I did scream that at him, I was probably getting from it one of the few pleasures a man in anguish can get. The pleasure of hitting back. Oh, it was little more than mere abuse. Telling God what I thought of him. And of course, as in most abusive language, what I thought didn't mean what I thought true. Only what I thought would offend him most. <laughs> and about two months after Joy died, I was lying in bed early in the morning and the sun was streaming through the window. And I thought, oh, I must go out for an early morning walk. And as I stepped out into the sunshine, it was as though this gentle breeze had been waiting for me. And it came by me, seemed to caress me, and then it moved off, but as it moved off, it was as though it took the mist with it. Because it was at that moment I realized I had been looking at things from the wrong perspective. You see, when I married Joy, I expected to have weeks, no more than months with her. I had been given just over three years. And it wasn't about what I hadn't been given, but what I had been given. And he was the giver. And she was the gift. You know, as I face the twilight years of my life, I like to think of myself as a seed waiting patiently in the ground, waiting to come up a flower in the gardener's good time, gardener with a capital G, waiting to come up into the real world, the real awakening. Look back on from there, this world will seem like a half-waking. And that's why I have this other feeling that grows and grows. It's as though I'm on the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door. I discern the freshness and purity of morning, but they do not make me fresh and pure. I cannot mingle as I would like with the splendors I see. But all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. One day, God willing, I will enter in. And in there, in beyond nature, I shall eat of the tree of life. I want to thank you, David, for your wonderful and inspiring work. And I think this uh, example is, uh, is a small token of, of your work. Um, the full play, incidentally, runs about 80 minutes. Um, 
And as, as I understand it, in your performances, you vary it as you go along because um, you're drawing on a very rich history uh, and knowledge that you have of Lewis, as well as your theatrical skills. <clears throat> I did want to ask you though, um, you've been widely celebrated for your work, but how exactly did you get your beginning in acting and your interest in Lewis? Well, it all started way back in the early 90s, um, 92. Um, I had to go, well, I didn't have to go, but I agreed to go to Nashville to be involved in a music project for a British company that wanted to set up a division in Nashville. And um, I was there for two or three years and I was supposed to go back to England and but uh, the contract got extended and during that extension I saw an advert, a little display ad, a, um, uh, a bulletin issued by a theatrical company in Nashville, Tennessee and the audition said, um, it was for Shadowland by the way, the, um, the um, uh, story about C.S. Lewis which was a stage play um, and a film. Anyway, it said auditions for Shadowlands British accents to help. And I thought, well, I've got a British accent. So um, I decided to go along and hoped I might get on a walk-on walk -on part, which didn't really require a British accent. And then I ended up winning um, the lead role, C.S. Lewis, and that's where it all started. And I don't know whether you can see it, but up there, there's a little poster, and that was Shadowlands. You probably can't see it. Yeah, we see it. But that poster is the, the poster that promoted the play in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm. That was my first acting role um, as C.S. Lewis. And can you believe that C.S. Lewis's stepson, Douglas Gresham, was there for our gala performance. Wow. 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 Now, this is the play Shadowlands by William Nicholson. That's right. Which was made into two major films. The BBC uh, did a version with Josh Acklin and Claire Bloom. And then Sir Richard Attenborough did one with Anthony Hopkins and Deborah Winger. Do you have right. a preference for either of those, by the way? Well, um, the, the, uh, the BBC one was more accurate in many ways. Yeah. They had two boys, whereas uh, the Anthony Hopkins film only had one boy. And that was because the director felt that it would, the audience could sympathize a lot stronger for one boy than two. So they cut David out and just did Douglas. Um, I thought, um, I really enjoyed Deborah Winger's uh, performance. It's not that I didn't enjoy Anthony Hopkins, <laughs> but when I was talking to Douglas once about Shadowlands, I asked him about Anthony Hopkins, and I said, how do you <coughs> Hopkins did it? And he said, well, Anthony plays Anthony, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I thought Deborah Winger uh, was just, Superb, but she really captured joy, and she did a week's um, a week's uh, research. I think with Lyle Lyle Dorset at Wheaton College area, mm -hmm. and um, preparing for the role. Well, I thought she was wonderful. I enjoyed that. Um, I enjoyed Anthony Hopkins. I mean, he's a great actor, and I enjoyed the film. Um, so um, anyway, that, I got into acting just by going, having a British accent and trying out for a role. Now, the play, An Evening with C.S. Lewis, is sort of your flagship play because you've written another, what, eight or more plays. Well, and yes. Um, the, the, yeah, the, um, I've written um, uh, a show called Lewis and Tolkien, which is the last meeting with C.S. Lewis and... Tolkien, um, and then I wrote a play called Weep for Joy, which for me was 
a more in-depth look of the Shadowlands story, mm -hmm. um, which although Shadowlands was a great film to watch, it was pretty light on the spiritual side, on the uh, on uh, Lewis's conflicts with God and losing joy and rest restoration of faith. And so I wanted to to explore that a little more. And so I wrote Weep for Joy. Um, and then um, the other relationship with Lewis, which is intriguing, there are three women really in Lewis's life, serious women. One was his mother who died when he was nine years old. Uh, one of course was Joy, who he met in his mid fifties. And then there was uh, what I call his adopted mother, um, Janie Moore, whom he met when he was 19 years old and had been introduced her, to her by a man he was sharing, um, he was billeted with in training for the First World War. And uh, his name was Paddy Moore. Paddy took Lewis back to his home at weekends, and that's when he met Paddy's mother. Her, his, her husband had walked out years ago and she had a daughter. And it seems as though they became strong enough friends, Paddy and Lewis, where, when they were on their way to the frontline trenches or getting ready to go to the frontline trenches. Paddy asked Lewis if, if he died in the First World War, which was very likely uh, for frontline trench warfare. Would Lewis look after Paddy's mother and Paddy's sister? And uh, he did die and Lewis kept his promise. And I think that is a reflection of one of the great as attributes of Lewis because she turned to be quite difficult in the end and Lewis was faithful to his promise until she died in a nursing home in Oxford. Right, yeah. So I wrote that once, so that's we, that was St. Jack and the Dragon, because she was a bit of a dragon, and I thought Jack was a bit of a saint to look after her. Um, and so that, that, those are Lewis-based plays, um, and I've written other ones. I wrote Prison of Passion, which is really um, um, a, an hour in the life of Paul the Apostle. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wrote it because of a new translation, which I'd done the audio work for, and um, they wanted me to, to to write a play for the launch. And it's really, um, it's an hour in the life of Paul the Apostle, and that hour is when he's under house arrest in Rome. And he, there is a servant girl that looks after his room, and she is a secret Christian to start off with, and then she reveals herself to Paul and he, he can talk to her about uh, many of the famous quotes he's in his Pauline epistles. So that's that one. Um, and I've just finished a new script called Winston. Mm -hmm. And it's about uh, Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you who don't know, um, David's company is called The Bird and Baby Productions. And if you Google it, you will find the schedule of his stage productions, which will hopefully be uh, uh, restarted in the new year, um, God willing. Uh, yeah, we've got some performances in January and in March, but I talked to our booking agent and he said he really doesn't think things are gonna open up until uh, late April, May, and really the serious business will be f from September onwards. Uh, there. The COVID thing is has uh, really well. We had had a full schedule um, th uh, at the beginning of uh, this year. We had a full schedule right through to December, mm -hmm. and then COVID came along, and after March, pretty well everything got cancelled. Now um, we're almost to the anniversary of Lewis's death, November twenty second. Mm -hmm. uh, he died in, in 1963, mm -hmm. on the same day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated and Aldous Huxley died. Mm -hmm. um, and even though Lewis was a world renowned figure because of the assassination of Kennedy, uh, most people uh, never learned of his death. Um, but 
uh, I think one thing that's interesting I want to ask you about was uh, Lewis and also Tolkien too, but Lewis believed, as I understand it, that uh, after two or three years after his death, no one would uh, remember who he was and his books would be out of print. But that's not exactly what's happened. <laughs> Do you have any comments on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think Lewis uh, couldn't conceive of his books really being around much long after his death. I think he felt that Tolkien's would be because he was so enamored with Tolkien's work. Um, but I think that um, if you could have told him that for sure, near the end of his death, 50, 60 years after he died, his books would be selling as well as they've ever sold. I right. think he would have just fallen over in disbelief. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think that the uh, one figure I've heard is that the Narnia books, the seven volumes have sold something like 150 million sets. Yeah, it's well over 100 million. Right, and I believe Lord of the Rings is about the same. So this, this tiny uh, informal literary group, the Inklings that they had, uh, has had one of the biggest impacts on world culture uh, with no really thought about trying to do that. I mean, they, they did want to write books that I felt needed to be written, but they had no expectation, I think, along those lines. No, and I mean, I think it's absolutely intriguing. I mean, the Inklings, yes, that was a very important group, but the two primary people in the Inklings were Tolkien and Lewis, and Lewis was the driving force behind the Inklings. But these two men who ended up in Oxford for different reasons, Tolkien was um, a professor at uh, Pembroke College. Lewis was a tutor at Magdalen College, and um, and they 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 come together because of the English curriculum, and which for many years, of course, it called during the intermediary years. But these two men, they one of the things that got them going was they said, look. We don't find what we are looking for by other writers, so we better write it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so Tolkien had already been involved with the Cimmerillion, uh, which later led to The Hobbit and um, and The Lord of the Rings. And, and Lewis, you know, uh, wrote various other novels in that genre and then ended up obviously writing the Narnia books. Um, and, uh, and, and, and these authors today are so successful so many years after the death, and yet it, two men, two Oxford professors who were very ordinary men, lived in very ordinary houses, and yet had such an incredible impact on, uh, on the world and on fantasy. And, and one of the funny things about Lewis also was that uh, he gave away something like 80 to 90 percent of his royalties and um, he didn't keep records of who he sent the money to because he, he had this massive correspondence and so the tax authorities would come after him. <laughs> he had no idea so he was always worried that he was going to be poor, he was going to be broke. Um, I did want to ask you what is it about Lewis that you find most rewarding or inspiring or uh, has had the biggest impact on you? Because I know the first book you read, as I understand it, was A Grief Observed because of the Shadowlands play. Is that right? Uh, the first book I read was The Screwtape Letters. Oh, The Screwtape Letters. Okay. I read that when I was 17 years old. All right. Um, I read A Grief Observed because in during the um, rehearsals for Shadowlands, the director said, I think you'll find A Grief Observed a good book to read to kind of get to feel the relationship with Jack right. and Joy. And so, and it is, of course it is. And so I actually memorized that. And I actually did that as a one man play, which I realized needed to be broader than just about that book. And that's when it, it sort of progressed into an evening with C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. So that was the second, was, well, I read Mere Christianity before that. Um, uh, so I, I, I've known Lewis, um, 
but it was a, a grief observed that really got me stuck into Lewis. Because Do you have I was a favorite part. book by Lewis? Pardon? Do you have a favorite book by Lewis? Yeah, I think so, I mean, I'm trying to think it's not the favorite book because it was Lewis's favorite book, and that was um, Till We Have Faces. Uh -huh. Yeah, he was most proud of his novel. Yeah. Yeah, he was. And, and I, I think the story is true. I was, you know, there's so much I've read of Lewis that sometimes I wonder whether I'm making things up. <laughs> <laughs> well, but um, I think that, uh, uh, as I understand it, Lewis had a bit of a writer's block about that book. He couldn't find the form to write it. And, um, and after he met Joy, it was her discussions uh, with him that enabled him to, to find the form to write that book. And, um, to the point where I think he felt she deserved as much credit as he did for he, the he book. He dedicated it to her, didn't he? Yes, that's right. And the interesting thing was, it was one of his least successful books. Huh. Yeah, it, for those of you who have not read it, it was his last novel that he was most proud of. It's a story of a, of a woman who becomes queen in a pre-Christian Greek city-state. Uh, and it's, 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 a, it's a retelling of the Cupid and Psyche story myth, but with uh, Lewisian uh, improvements, I guess you, you could say. Oh, it's uh, a great book. I love it. Uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's an Fabulous. amazing, and it'll surprise you. Yeah. Um, it's not very long either. It's not. It's a very short book, considering. So since you, you did the um, Shadowlands, of course, and then the additional play uh, about the three women that were influential in particular in Lewis's life, um, Lewis, of course, was very close to his mother, uh, who died of cancer when he was nine, and then his wife died of cancer, um, and his mother's death was a key factor in his turning away from Christianity. In fact, really, uh, what I understand is that he was, one of his plans was to write the definitive book against theism, uh, mm -hmm. but every argument that he thought he had mastered just sort of turned to dust. And then he, in, in his autobiography, talks about how he was the most reluctant, dejected convert in all of England, because he sort of argued himself into a corner. Either he had to admit that God existed, or he had to <laughs> essentially admit that he uh, could not argue. Um, but do you, do you see anything about that interesting juxtaposition of his mother's death from cancer and Joy's death from cancer as far as it's almost like a bookend. Uh, of his yeah, life. and I think, yeah, I mean, of course, his, uh, you have this sense that, um, that Lewis as a boy found, I mean, he was, he was struck down with grief, but couldn't cry. And, and that was, that's how he dealt with, it was a big shock to him. Um, uh, I think joy dying of cancer was just a reminder of, of that time. I'm sure it took him back to that time. And of course, when you read A Grief Observed, which is the book he wrote after joy died, I mean, the first half of the book is very, is very dark because he's so, he's devastated, he's angry. I mean, he's angry with God. Uh, he calls God a, a cosmic sadist, a, a, an eternal vivisector, <laughs> and um, and and you can you almost sense that it, it it's not just joy. He that the, there's reflections of his mother, whom he prayed would be healed, and um, and and God didn't heal her. Um, and then, of course, halfway through the book he goes out for this early morning walk and in the sunshine there's a gentle breeze and he suddenly or he starts to see things from a different perspective yeah, yeah. and that um and he realizes that and starts to be very positive about joy um where he'd been very negative about joy not about her but about, about her her dying um yeah, so I think, I think, I can't believe that, the, I mean, we don't know it, but I can't believe that there weren't uh, the uh, sort of the resurfacing of 
the anger that he felt when his mother died. Let me ask one more question, then we'll open it up for our um, audience and participants. Um, Lewis uh, was, one of the things that's interesting about him, I believe, is that he wrote all these books in apologetics and his scholarly books. There's something like a hundred books of his work now, and I think something over 300 books about him. Every year there's another 20, 10 or 20 books about him. So there's just an endless mm -hmm. um, web <laughs> to draw on. And I believe that Netflix is gonna be doing uh, the Narnia series. They are. Right? And, uh, so it, it's, it's like there's no limit to the impact that what he, he dove into is significance. And uh, so it, it's a real um, blessing to see you pursuing using his work and bringing it to all these wonderful audiences. Is there, is there anything that you've learned most about your experience with uh, writing the plays and acting and and, di and digging into Lewis's background that you think is particularly worth sharing with other people? Well, I think the one thing that to me comes out to me is, you know, when you're playing someone like C.S. Lewis, any, I guess any actor, when they're looking at a person they're playing, they try and get into, into the mindset of the actor. The, a Grief Observed is a wonderful book to get a feel for Lewis. Um, um, but um, the things that really stand out to me um, are one that I think in, in many ways, he was a very humble man. He lived a very modest life. You talk about his finances, he always was worried about finances, and yet he was never really in danger of going broke. But he was brought up to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, and yet he was so generous with his royalties, as you pointed out. Um, uh, and, and, and you look at these aspects of the man, you think, well, what a good man he was. Um, he wasn't perfect. None of us are. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it was Douglas, maybe one or two others say that he was the most thoroughly Christian man they've ever met. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably true. As I say, he wasn't perfect, um, right. but um, you, you were, I, I, I've come really to admire the man. Mm -hmm. And when you delve into somebody like that, there's a chance that you can come up and say, oh, well, he's not quite the man I thought he was. And yet I've always considered it a great honor. And um, people say, has it affected your own spiritual life to ask me if it's affected my own spiritual life? And I think it's a bit pompous to say, oh yes, I think he has. But I think, you know, the way I look at it is I think, oh, well, if I could be, if I could have the reputation that he had uh, for what he was, then I'd be a happy man. So um, let me open it up for questions from people. And Mark Lumbus. Okay, Mark. I wanted to ask if nearly every sentence in that delightful play that you performed for us this evening or on that video comes from something that Lewis wrote, or is some of it something that you made up that, uh, that you felt fitted his character, which isn't actually from his writing? Um, well, uh, um, I would think maybe uh, 10, 15% is directly from Lewis's writings. Um, there's things that we don't, we, we don't know that we, have to surmise according to the knowledge we have, and therefore you construct a play like that. Um, I have people come up to me sometimes and they say, oh, I love that quote that you quote, and they give me the quote, and they'll say, now which, I can't, I can't remember which book I wrote it in. And I will, and they say, and I say, well, he didn't write it. Um, I wrote it, but I wrote it in the way that I felt that Lewis would would give it. Lewis was known for his humour, for a start. You know, you couldn't, uh, Douglas Gresham, his stepson, says you couldn't be in a room more than five minutes with Lewis without there being peals of laughter. He had very boyish humour, 
And, um, and I remember when I was talking to Douglas and I was just had launched an evening with C.S. Lewis and we were on, a, we were at a, a conference, can you believe, in Nashville, which is where I live. We were at a conference in Nashville and um, Douglas was a key speaker on one night and I was doing an evening with C.S. Lewis the next night. And I said to Douglas, I said, is there any chance you can stay over and see the play? I'd like your thoughts on it. And he said, I can't, David. He said, I've got to go and do another speech for another college. He said, but I'll tell you this, it better be funny. <laughs> and that's what Douglas said to me. So, um, yes, about 10% to 15% is directly direct quotes. Some of it is, is, is what I would call paraphrasing. In other words, taking the thoughts of Lewis. And when I was researching the book, and when I was writing the play, my whole objective was to find the man behind the books. And so I did a lot of research of not, what I, I read a, a lot of his letters, you know, Warney compiled his letters, his brother Warney compiled his letters into a book. There's a book called Letters to an American Lady. I read a lot of those, I read them all actually, because um, you can find out a man about his books, but you'll certainly find out a lot when you read his letters. And yeah, so, Hooper's edited, uh, so that was, that was what I tried to do. Okay. Okay, Gregory. Uh, two questions that are related about um, about being a playwright. Uh, what what drew you to Churchill? And I remember reading that C.S. Lewis said writing screw tape letters was very uncomfortable for him because he had to uh, invert joy. And I and I was wondering, have you ever considered doing a one man play playing screw tape? you know, snickering at sending out uh, a lesser well, devil? Yeah, I didn't uh, actually, when um, David asked me what books, what plays I'd written, I actually wrote a play, um, firstly, um, years ago, many years ago, I did uh, get permission from the agents of the C.S. Lewis estate at that time, they've since changed, to do a version of the screw tape Letters. And so I played uh, screw tape, and um, I had twelve demons, um, and uh, from a college, can you believe? Um, <coughs> and I had twelve demons, um, and then I wanted to actually take the screw tape concept and and re redo it in my own way. Not I couldn't possibly do it as good as Lewis, obviously. But Lewis didn't write a play, he wrote a book. And I wanted to write a play, so I called my play Target Practice, the targets being humans. And in, in a similar way, I wanted to look at temptation from the enemy's point of view. So I called, it wasn't screw tape, it was in a set in the Academy of Fiends, and I was Professor Damon, and I had either a cast of 12 or even down to two and even down to one so I could do a smaller version for smaller productions um, and I really enjoyed that and the thing about Lewis was is he, he he found it the most gritty book to write because all he said all I had to do was think about all the problems I'd had the previous week and I had my I had my research <laughs> there you go can you hear me now yes okay, okay. Um, I came late into the game. Uh, my son was at uh, Fort Benning near Nashville and went to Princeton, was an officer in the Army, and he just loves C.W. Lewis, and he told me to get involved. So this is the first um, – I read the book, one of the books, and this is the first meeting. I, I just enjoyed it immensely. Um, uh, I was a lapsed Catholic, and I came back to the faith. And I'm, I'm a retired uh, Marine Corps colonel. And I'm wondering his uh, experience in the First World War. I know in my life, I was in Vietnam. That affected me the last 50 years. How did his uh, experience in the First World War affect his life when he came back to England? The C.S. Lewis and the war years, the First World War, um, 
Uh, Lewis had a really interesting perception of that war. Firstly, um, there was every chance he wouldn't come back from that war because the carnage on the frontline trenches um, in human lives was, uh, was awful. Um, but he had this ability to almost see it as um, something that wasn't really happening to him. It was almost like it was surreal. And, um, and he could almost separate himself. He was there, but in a sense, he, he didn't um, feel the strength of that war. A bullet would pass by. And he said, oh, it reminds me of what Homer wrote. Yes. Um, and it was a, almost a detachment. Um, and I think that was probably part of the process the mind has for self-preservation when you are in intense danger. So, um, and I'm not sure whether it affected much of his writings. I think it affected more Tolkien in his writings than it affected Lewis. But that's only that's only my perception of it, because when you when you read his biography and, and read about his war experience, it's, it's not terribly in depth. He does talk about um, uh, men crawling around like beetles, dead corpses and things like that. And so it obviously did affect him. Um, but it, it seems to me he was able to almost separate himself from it. Do you want to mention um, what uh, happened to him and, and how he was released from the war? You remember? Well, he got um, wounded. Right. Um, sergeant next to him was killed. Pardon? He, he, well, he his sergeant was killed. His sergeant, because the sergeant um, stood between him, as I understand it, between the shell and and Lewis. So the sergeant was killed outright. Lewis got um, shrapnel wounds um, uh, severe enough to have him sent back to England. And by the time he had fully recovered, the war was over. But he always had a piece of shrapnel very close to his heart. Because yeah. they decided they wouldn't take it out as it was too dangerous. Yeah, that's, that's my understanding. Uh, okay, uh, Drew? So, have you ever considered writing a play about how C.S. Lewis wrote Narnia? Well, my play, An Evening with C.S. Lewis, um, in... Well, it actually, uh, I wrote a play, Tolkien, and Lewis and Tolkien. And they, um, in the second act, they tend to talk about why they wrote what they did. And so the, uh, Lewis uh, actually says, talks to Tolkien about why what he says what other people say about him, why he wrote what he, he he's he says no what no matter what i say about uh, why i wrote the books of narnia people don't believe it and then he goes on to say why he wrote the books of narnia um and um uh, and, um, and and he says it all started with images that rose in his mind a fawn an umbrella um, a, a queen on a sledge, a magnificent lion. And he says, a, 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 a lion whom I met in a nightmare. And then he goes on to say why he wrote that and how the Christian part came in to the books, which came in later after he had conceived the story. Didn't they have a, didn't they flip a coin or something about one of them was going to write one kind of book and the other was going to write a different book. Do you know about that? I thought that was a space trilogy. Well, yeah, that's it. You're right. Yeah, they did. They did. They flipped a coin. I'm not quite sure the whole story. Okay, Gregory, you have another question? Yeah. Um, you as an actor, do you have, you know, 220 minutes worth of material and you pick and choose which episodes you're going to play each night or is the play exactly the same each night? It, it feels like there are sort of modules that you could put in or out. Yeah, you know what? Um, I were, I go on the basis if it ain't broke, don't try and fix it. So the play I, the play I did when I first did it years ago in 1990, around about 2000, if you'd have been at that play and you were now to see the play as it is now, 
it's a different play. It's a different play, partly because of content. It's a different play because when you've done a play, as many times have I done it, as I have done it, you find out what the audience likes. And so I have found out what the audience appreciates. Um, and it's not like pandering to the audience, but it's also, you know, as an actor, the last thing you want to do is lose the attention of the audience. It's the worst thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So you make sure you keep that attention. Um, and so I don't change it a lot. I tell you what does change. It's delivery. I find a lot of fun in adjusting the delivery. Mm. And that's what keeps it fresh. But there are tweaks. I, I've just done a few tweaks for the in the last, well, I can tell you now, in the last two weeks, three weeks, I've just done um, maybe four or five what I call major tweaks. Mm -hmm. and, um, and COVID has allowed me to do it because... I was going back over my script and I thought, you know what? I think that could be better. And so I've done that. So if you saw the, uh, David, if you saw the play, the new play, you'd say, I'm not sure I remember that because it is different. Well, even, even the version that you edited down for us tonight is different from the play that we had in San Francisco. I mean, yeah, because it was four years, that version you saw was done four years ago. We are, by the way, recording a brand new version in the next, uh, I think, two months. Oh, good. Okay, Robert, you had a question? Yeah, so actually I saw the play in San Francisco last year. And to me, the most memorable part or the most inspirational part was the story of Hamlet. How during his atheist years, he said, you know, how could Hamlet say, I want to meet Shakespeare? It makes no sense. You know, how can we possibly want to get to know God? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but then later he said, Hamlet could know Shakespeare if Shakespeare wrote himself into the story. And that is Jesus. Jesus wrote himself into our story. And that's how we know him. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought that part of the play, that's the one part that stuck out to me the most. And I was curious which book that came from, like, like, when did, when did Lewis tell that story? Um, you know, I'm trying to think of it now. Uh, I know the quote. Um, um, I think it probably may have come out of um, uh, Surprised by Joy. I think, I, I, you know, what I okay. don't... It, the, one, of, one of my problems is that I'm, um, when I started this, writing this and doing it, I was 55 years old. <clears throat> I'm now 78. So to go back all those many years and figure out, well, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Doesn't always work. Um, and, um, but I got a feeling it's right. from Surprised by Joy, but I couldn't be sure. By the way, if, for those who have not read okay, uh, thank the you. edited collections of Lewis's um, nonfiction essays, um, I would highly recommend it. There's, uh, God in the Dock is probably the best. Christian Reflections is, is another excellent one. There, and there are many others. And a lot of people don't even know about them. I, I also want to ask you, David, about your own conversion and how that was affected by your work on Lewis. Well, I was really converted when I was 16 years old. And it was at a Billy Graham rally. It wasn't um, uh, at the stadium. It was, a, I went to a church that was taking a live feed from the stadium. In those days, that was quite major technology. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's when I realized that, <coughs> that the, the, the challenge of Christianity was not just to accept Christ as a savior, but to accept Christ as Lord. Mm -hmm. and that's when I became serious about that and then um, um, and I got involved with all sorts of activities um, evangelistic etc and um, uh, um, my first wife and I my first wife died uh, five years ago my first wife and I uh, were very um, involved in youth work for 20 years um, in our local church. Um, 
but um, and it was really um, the latter years that I got in, got involved doing Lewis. Um, so, so did your church work have? I guess that had a was a factor in your decision to try out for the Shadowlands play. No, not at all. <laughs> no, I was um, I was in Nashville. Um, I'd been involved in music, um, Christian music particularly. I've been involved with Christian music for 20 odd years, mostly in England, but now in Nashville. And, you know, you get to a point sometimes when you're involved in something for so long, you're almost on autopilot. And it's being on autopilot is not very satisfactory. Yeah. And I was desperate to find something that would take me out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And I saw this little display ad and it said auditions for Shadowlands British accents to help, and I thought, well, now that's interesting. And, um, you know, I've got a British accent, so I'm going to have a shot at it, thinking I might get a small part. And as I said earlier, mm -hmm. I won the lead role. And, and it not just took me out of my comfort zone, it threw me into an experience and an excitement and an involvement and an energy I've not known for a number of years. And I realized then that it would be acting and not music. Now, originally, as I understand it, most of the performances you were doing for years were with churches yep. um, and other perhaps parachurch para groups. Mm -hmm. But then the popularity and the word spread. And now you're, now you're at major theaters and concert halls. And it's, it's very exciting. Yeah, well, I, st I started off in churches because I had an agent that really sold uh, the uh, the acts that they did, Christian acts, to churches. But one day I said to him, I said, look, I'm an actor. I, I'm enjoying doing the work at churches, but I'm an actor. I want to get on in, into a theatre, not just churches. I don't mind doing churches, but I want to... I want to find out whether people would come along to a theatre and say, oh, this is good, or whether they'd say, no, that keep him in churches, that's where he belongs. And, um, and uh, you've heard of Moody Radio, I'm sure. Sure. The guy, there's a guy doing Moody Radio in Indianapolis, and he wanted me to do a performance in Indianapolis linked to his radio station. And it was the only time I said no. He wanted to do it in a church. And I said no. I'll tell you what, I'll do it if you do it in a theatre. He said, well, we can't make it work. I said, well, then I'm not going to do it. I, if you want to do it in a theatre, I'll come and do it. I won't do it in a church. Now, I may have been a bit bullshit and shouldn't have done. But anyway, I stuck to my guns. And he said, well, there is a theatre. It seats 1,200 people. He said, but I don't know whether we can make it work. And I said, well, I tell you what, I don't mind if it doesn't work. I, I don't, you don't need to pay me. And uh, so they did it in a theatre and they drew a thousand people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, here in the secular Bay Area in San Francisco last spring, you had six shows six shows over right. 2,000 people. Over 2,000 people, spring, yeah. They were supposed to be in San Jose and had had five or so shows in a large theater in San Jose, which unfortunately had to cancel. Because yeah, well, we had, we had San, Francisco, San Jose was well, was very heavily booked. Yeah. And then we were due to go <coughs> to San Antonio just as the COVID thing, and that was almost sold out and that was canceled. Yeah. Right. And so now <coughs> we mostly do theaters because we have an, I had at the beginning of 20, to you this year, um, or started in the middle of last year, we, ha we had a new agent who, who only books theatres. Yeah. Um, and um, Clearly there's a huge hunger for it. Huge, oh, yeah. there is. I mean, um, we did La Mirada in, um, which is a 1,200 seat theatre in, in Los Angeles, 1,200 seats sold. Yeah. Um, there is, a, a, there's a, and a lot of people who like Lewis or Christians, a lot of people are willing to go to the theater and see it. Yeah. Um, and for me, to, um, I'm glad when people come to the theater 
Uh, in Chicago, I forget how many we had there. We had over 6,000 people in Chicago. Well, plus you have people who are just subscribers to different theaters. Yeah, that's right. They, yeah. just, they yeah. like live theater, so it's a wonderful opportunity. And the agent doesn't go to churches. He yeah. just, right. most theaters, uh, decent sized theaters have what they call the Broadway list. And he that's, just markets to the Broadway list. And that's where yeah, we get And that's theater. the whole point of the C.S. Lewis Society is we, we it, it is outreach. So a lot of people just go, oh, it's a, you know, it's a play. I like going to live yeah. performances. Yeah. So it's an opportunity for us to help them know that there's a, a deeper magic yeah. that you can come into. So it's, it's really, and your play is just such a wonderful taste that will make people want to learn more. And that's, that's, the, that's the joy I have is, you know, I, I no longer go into a theatre wondering whether the audience will enjoy it. I oh. know they're going to enjoy it. Right. And, um, and that they, they, I always said when I started to do theatres, I'm, people say, well, is it a Christian play? And I say, no, in a way, it's not a Christian play. It's a play about a man who happened to be a Christian. Right, yeah. exactly. That's what the play is about. Yeah. And so when people come along, whether they're Christians or non-Christians, I want them to be able to walk out and say, well, that was worth the money I paid for it. Yeah. Well, and they well do. We were so like in your run in San Francisco last year, we tabled um, in the lobby and had books and other material for C.S. Lewis outside. And I, just the joy of people coming out of the theater, you know, the chatter and the just the high energy you could yeah. you know, palpable. Well, that's why I keep on doing it. You can't. You, when you when you get an audience reaction like that, both at the end of the show and when you talk to people after the show, you think, well, it's worth doing. It's amazing what people, everybody takes something different away from the play. And everybody. just imagine how hungry everybody's going to be after we get to leave our homes. <laughs> <laughs> He's starving for you, David. Though. That's right. Well, Lewis, you know, Lewis is fairly unique in that he has standing in the secular culture. That's right. Um, and of course, one of his famous uh, sayings is he wanted to write in ways to uh, people sneak past the watchful dragons of the secular world and uh, just, you know, sort of the, the excuses that people have of uh, vanity and narcissism and so forth. Um, and uh, I think getting back to what I was asking before, which is kind of, I think, really stunningly amazing, is that Lewis's work, which was in so many different areas as far as his writing, but his own life itself was almost a metaphor of uh, Christian apologetics itself. I mean, it's a fascinating, that's why these films have been done about him. Yeah. And how many, how many people of any type are like that? Not many. No. Right. Oh, he's, he, Lewis was unique and, and, of course, was a great writer. And that's why his work still stands today. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Marvelous. So I don't see any more hands raised. Uh, we really want everybody to appreciate the fact that David is on Eastern time. Yes. So it's now 12.30 a.m. Um, yeah, I thought I might be asleep by now, but I managed to stay awake. That's right. So we and we. I mean, you were just so generous to provide us with this edited version of your play. That's right. To so join us tonight. One thing also, David is going to be um, uh, recorded uh, for the Mike Huckabee, Huckabee show on Friday, which is shown on Monday on the TBN network. Uh, Saturday and Sunday on the TBN network yeah. and Monday on, I think it's the new, that new news program, Newsmax or something like oh, that. Oh, maybe Newsmax. Okay. Oh, okay. good. Fabulous. That's a great Saturday and Sunday on, on, um, TBN, and then uh, on Newsmax on Monday. Fantastic. We'll put links on our Facebook page too. That's everybody. right, exactly. So I want to thank everyone. We, um, uh, as time goes on, of course, the, the total number of people with us uh, declines, but uh, I think we had, we were up to uh, 140. 140 people or so. Good. Um, and uh, for those of you who uh, are new or not. As far away as David, if you think you're up late, we had someone from England joining us. So. Oh, really? Good. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, again, our website is lewissociety.org. 
send us a note. We're happy to add you to our mailing list. We, during the year, have a book and film club, and we do all sorts of other things uh, when possible to uh, get the word out as far as working with people interested or inspired by Lewis. And David is a real inspiration um, in himself. Um, and I want to really thank David from the bottom of our heart for doing this with us and for all of his work. Uh, and God bless you, David, and everybody um, as we enter the Thanksgiving and Christmas seasons and the coming new year. So well, I hope you all have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. See you, folks. Bye. Bye. Bye.